February 3, 2006 at 11.33 p.m., my life changed forever with the birth of my first child, Andrew Mark Opperly, or Drew as we call him. My life changed because uh, as a parent, and those of you who are parents, you get this, uh, there are ways that you give of yourself and you sacrifice for your child that you wouldn't for anyone else. And well, a few years later, we added Kate to our family. And through my children, I've come to know some important things. Uh, I know a whole new level of unconditional love for a child, no matter what their age or stage in life. I know a level of care and concern that I didn't know I had. I know an experience of joy and heartache and stress and happiness and a host of other soul-deep emotions and experiences. I know a deeper appreciation for my own parents and what I put them through. But most importantly, I know a lot more of what God must experience as we are all God's children. If you are a parent, you know what I'm talking about. Hi, my name is Mark, and I'm the pastor of Sycamore Creek in Potterville. We are concluding our series today called Bless This Mess. And while I'm praying that everyone who hears this will know the good news, that God loves you and that God wants to be in a relationship with you. And the Bible consistently describes God as a perfect, loving parent. Uh, that can be hard to imagine with all the variety of experiences that we've had with parents, but God, like any good parent, wants a deep, rich, and healthy relationship with God's kids. I pray that today as we talk about parenting, whether you are a parent or not, that you will know the love of God expressed through Jesus. You see, God wants to bless you today, even if and even when our lives are a mess. We've been talking throughout this series about the blessing of the messiness of relationships. We started with God's unconditional love for us shown at Easter through Jesus that restores us to a relationship with God and, and then it restores our relationships with each other. We've been reminding ourselves each week that God wants to bless all of our relationships, including our friendships, our families, our marriages, and well, our parenting. Now that blessing is possible even if and, and even when those relationships are messy. And they will be. And now while we focus on parenting today, I want to remind you that in the family of God, we have responsibility for one another. Uh, the Apostle Paul was an unmarried leader in the early church, and well, he had no children of his own. He wrote 13 letters that are now part of the New Testament of the Bible. And in those letters, he uses familial language 277 times. 277 times! That's a lot! He refers to those younger in the faith as my dear spiritual children and, and compares his anguish when they act immaturely as labor pains. Uh, so here's the thing. If you're not a parent, if you're not a grandparent, if you're not a foster parent, if you have no responsibilities for children in your own home, you can find spiritual children. Spiritual children who need your support to encourage them in the faith. I'm here in our Kids Creek area here in Potterville as a reminder today of our church supporting children and families. My family needs this. My family needs support and encouragement, and I know others do too. My, my wife, Jana, and I, we can't train Drew and Kate by ourselves in loving Jesus. We need you all, and, and the same is true for all families. There are no perfect per parents on earth, and we need one another to fill in the gaps and to help our children to grow to be fully devoted followers of Jesus. You see, here's the truth. No parent can raise a child without help. When I became a dad, I quickly realized how daunting and challenging the task was before me. And even though I had, I had loving parents of my own, even though I had read books on parenting, even though I asked for help from other parents, I have still managed to mess up as a dad many times many times. Because raising children is difficult. Honestly, I'm learning right now how to parent teenagers, and I've often thought to myself over the past 15 years, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> I can't parent without help. You can't parent without help. We need the collective wisdom and experience of our community when it comes to parenting. So here's a question for you to consider. What's a helpful piece of parenting advice that you've heard? Let's discuss. And today we're going to uh, dig into an Old Testament story for help with God blessing the mess of parenting. And here's what we're going to do today through this story. God blesses my messy parenting when I continually entrust my children to the Lord and leverage my influence as a parent. Entrust, influence. 
That's our key thought for today. And one of the things I love about the Bible is reading about people like me. In the stories of Scripture, we find people with problems and shortcomings just like us. We also find how God blesses people in the midst of their messes when they turn to God for help. You see, even the heroes of the Bible had imperfect parents, and that includes Jesus. So in 1 Samuel chapter 1, we meet a woman who desperately wanted a child, and that's a longing that may resonate for some of you. And in fact, that may be a painful, messy area for you. And may we encounter God's grace through this story. So in our story, there's a woman named Hannah. And as you will see, Hannah's story is not neat and tidy. In fact, Hannah's life was messy. Her husband's name was Elkanah, and he had another wife along with Hannah named Penina. Yes, that's right. Elkanah had two wives. He clearly missed Tom's message last week on the messiness of marriage. Now, polygamy was practiced in biblical times for a host of reasons. Uh, The main one was economic. So the more wives that a man had, the more children he could have, and that produced more personal and and even more national wealth. So large families with multiple wives and many children were considered at that time to be a sign of God's blessing. Now, over time, though, as our understanding of God and God's design for human beings increased, Our culture has changed to reflect that understanding. This uh, polygamy has become less common, but at this point in the biblical narrative, it was still widely practiced. Now, as you might expect, Elkanah's two wives were not exactly best friends forever. And actually, they were rivals because Penina had children and Hannah did not. Now, to not have children at that time was a huge deal. Again, remember, large families were a sign of God's blessing. So uh, to not have children at this time in history was, was basically to fail your family. Uh, worse yet, not having children was considered to be a punishment from God. So uh, we're in the midst of an Old Testament mess here, and Hannah's life was a mess. We pick up this story of Hannah told in 1 Samuel, and when we get to the end of this passage, we'll see how Hannah's egotistical and clueless husband, Elkanah, doesn't help manners. Here we go. Each year, Elkanah would travel to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of Heaven's armies at the tabernacle. The priests of the Lord at that time were the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. On the days Elkanah presented his sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to Penina and each of her children. And though he loved Hannah, he would give her only one choice portion because the Lord had given her no children. So Penina would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. Year after year, it was the same. Penina would taunt Hannah as they went to the tabernacle. Each time, Hannah would be reduced to tears and would not even eat. Why are you crying, Hannah? Elkanah would ask. Why aren't you eating? Why be downhearted just because you have no children? You have me. Isn't that better than having 10 sons? This is a crazy story, isn't it? Poor Hannah. Uh, Her husband, Elkanah, seems like a fine catch, doesn't he? Uh, Lest you miss it, let me highlight. On the way to and from worship, Elkanah allowed his one wife to taunt his other wife, Hannah. Now, we might think that coming to worship would bring comfort, but for Hannah, it was a journey that was used to rub her failure in her face. Uh, The trip to Shiloh was probably about 15 miles from their home, so Penina had plenty of time to taunt Hannah and, and to make fun of her because she had no children. Now, to make matters worse, part of the worship ceremony was that the man of the house would take time to give portions of meat to each member of the family. Imagine Hannah watching her rival wife and her children eat with a smile on their faces. Every year, Hannah would break down into a heap of tears and she wouldn't eat. Now, Hannah's attempts at words of comfort, well, they're both outrageous and they're a bit narcissistic. Why are you crying, Hannah, he says. Why be downhearted just because you have no children? You have me. Isn't that better than 10 sons? Now, I know Tom covered marriage last week, but, but here's a pro tip for marriage. There are a number of helpful responses from Elkana in this situation. This is not one of them. <laughs> I don't know if you, have you ever felt like Hannah? Have you ever felt downhearted, frustrated at the end of your rope? Life can often be messy and confusing, even for devoted followers of Christ. And when in preparing this message, I came across the opening lines of a book entitled Messy Spirituality, God's Annoying Love for Imperfect People. And the opening lines of the book say this, my life is a mess. 
After 45 years of trying to follow Jesus, I keep losing him in the busyness of my life. I know Jesus is there somewhere, but it's difficult to see him in the haze of everyday life. I want desperately to know God better. I want to be consistent, but right now the only consistency in my life is inconsistency. Who I want to be and who I am are not very close together. I resonate with that last line from the author, who I want to be and and who I am are not very close together. That's that's true in a lot of areas of my life, including my parenting. Uh, Who I want to be and and who I am, well, they're not always close together. So here's a question. In what area of your life is who you are and who you want to be not very close together? A reminder that you can anonymously send in text messages to the number on the screen. Let's discuss. What we need to hear today is this important reminder that God wants to meet us in the midst of our mess. God wants to meet you right now, and not after you've somehow cleaned up your life and and become my best version of me. Uh, Jesus comes to me. Jesus comes to you. Uh, Even when we're flawed and frustrated and in distress, this is Hannah's story, blessing in the midst of mess. And this is our story today. Hannah desperately wanted to be a mom, and the gap between her reality and her heart's desire was huge. She's part of this super dysfunctional family mess, but, and this is important, this dysfunctional family had at least one thing, right? Every year, the scripture tells us, and year after year, they sought to worship the Lord of Heaven's armies at their tabernacle. We need to note that they didn't let their dysfunction keep them from seeking God. Please, 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 whatever you are going through today, do not let whatever you're going through keep you from seeking God. That will just take a messy, difficult situation and it'll make it worse. The good news is that whatever messed up situation you are in, God is already present there. You just need to ask. You just need to seek God. And and here's more good news. God listens. You see, God heard the cry of Hannah's heart. And once after a sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. Eli the priest was sitting at his customary place beside the entrance of the tabernacle, and Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. And she made this vow. O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I'll give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime, and as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. I remember Hannah was usually a mess of tears at the sacrificial meal. This year, however, she went back into the tabernacle to pray alone with only Eli the priest nearby. Can you imagine the drama of her prayer? She's in deep anguish, crying bitter tears. Her lips are moving in prayer, but no words are coming out, leading Eli the priest to accuse her of being drunk. (laughs) Why? First, Hannah's rival makes fun of her for not having children. Then they have a dinner where she gets to see that she's not blessed. Next, her husband is clueless and says the wrong thing. And finally, her priest sees her praying and accuses her of being drunk. (sighs) Poor Hannah. This is an epic mess. And in this mess, Hannah would have had every reason not to pray, but she does. Then she corrects Eli and she confesses to him her discouragement. She hadn't been drinking. She'd been pouring out her sorrows to God. And in her prayer, she makes a promise to God. Her promise was that if God would give her a son, she would give him back to God. You see, Jews believed that anything was, that was not cut was a sign that it belonged to God. So she raised the level of her promise by vowing her son's hair would not be cut. Hannah's a mess. She's desperate. And she says to God in prayer, Let's make a deal. This leads to a tough question to consider. Can we make deals with God? Can can we manipulate God by making promises? It's a tough question, isn't it? And here's my take. I don't believe that God plays games with us. God is not manipulated by us. God is not manipulative, but we don't make deals with God. Prayer isn't really a formula. We don't just promise to do things and then we get whatever we want. However, I do believe that God welcomes our honest, heartfelt prayers. In that posture, we can pray, Lord, if you'll just, then I will so on prayers. But there's no guarantee that God will answer our prayer in the way we think God should. Again, God wants us to pray honest, heartfelt prayers, but at the end of the day, God is God and we are not, and well, God will do what God wants to do. 
Notice uh, that Hannah does a dramatic thing here and that even before she has a child, he, she offers her life and her future child to God. And, and God does a miracle here that can be easily missed because of the more dramatic miracle that's going to come. Uh, the first miracle is that even though her circumstances have not changed, Hannah has changed. Look with me at our conversation with the priest Eli after her prayer. In that case, Eli said, go in peace. I may the God of Israel grant the request you have asked of him. Oh, thank you, sir, she exclaimed. And then she went back and began to eat again, and she was no longer sad. This is important to note. God had not answered her prayer yet. A child had was not what brought her out of her despair. Eli prayed that God would grant Hannah's request. Then she went back and began to eat again, and she was no longer sad. Before this encounter, she wouldn't eat, but now she eats. She joins in the celebration. Before this encounter with God, she wept bitterly and her heart was sad, but not anymore. It's like the whole matter was settled in that moment for Hannah inwardly. And Hannah didn't know in that moment whether God would answer her prayer or, or the way God would answer it. And yet, she was transformed. Nothing had changed and yet everything had changed. She went back. She began to eat and her sadness lifted before her prayer was answered. Now, soon after that, a second miracle occurs and Hannah does conceive a child. She has a son named Samuel and she entrusts her child to the Lord. When Samuel was still a child, Hannah returned to the tabernacle and she found the priest Eli. Sir, do you remember me? Hannah asked. I'm the very woman who stood here several years ago praying to the Lord. I asked the Lord to give me this boy and he has granted my request. Now I'm giving him to the Lord, and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. And they worshiped the Lord there. As Hannah had done year after year, she returned to the tabernacle to worship, and she gave her son to God. Now Samuel would grow up to be mentored by Eli, and he would become one of Israel's greatest prophets. Uh, he became the kingmaker. Uh, he anointed King Saul and King David. And again, here's our point today. God blesses my messy parenting when I continually entrust my children to the Lord and leverage my influence as a parent. You see, Hannah lived the words found in one of Paul's New Testament letters to the church at Ephesus. Uh, Paul wrote, As for parents, don't provoke your children to anger, but raise them with discipline, that's influence, and instruction about the Lord, that's entrusting them to God. In the mess of her circumstances, what Hannah understood is that our calling as parents, as grandparents, as foster parents, as guardians, as mentors in the faith is to raise children with discipline and with instruction about the Lord. Children of all ages in our church, they look to parents and they look to other adults in the faith to model for them what it looks like to live as a fully devoted follower of Jesus. You see, faith in Jesus is more caught than it is taught. How do we do this? Well, the paradox of parenting is that when God entrusts us with a child, we are called to immediately and continually entrust the child back to God. This is what Hannah modeled for us. Before, during, and after Samuel's birth, Hannah entrusts her son to the care of God. She, she shows herself and her son that the, the Lord of Heaven's armies is in charge, not her. Let me put our main point another way. I invite God into my messy parenting when I continually entrust my children to the Lord and leverage my influence. Uh, before I get to our next section, I, I want you to ponder and discuss for a moment, what does it look like to entrust children to the Lord? What actions are involved with that? Let's discuss. We spent a lot of time exploring who we are as parents because entrusting our children to the Lord is super important. Our kids are God's kids. But that doesn't mean we don't have a vital role to play. Parents, grandparents, foster parents, guardians, people of God, you have an essential role to play in the life of a child or an adolescent. Yes, entrust your children to God and leverage your influence. Leverage your influence. Uh, this is where our actions come into play, and I want to give you two quick tips for leveraging your influence. So the first tip for leveraging your influence is that you leverage your influence by being a parent. Being a parent. 
There is a clear authority that parents have over their children. Parents have power. I didn't start with this power because it's incredibly important for parents and adults to first and foremost have a loving relationship with God. This power can be wielded lovingly or it can go horribly awry. From a loving and intimate relationship with God, we approach the power and authority that we have as parents. You see, if you don't start with a foundation of God's love for you and your love for God, it's super easy to misuse the power that parents have over children. I could give many examples of this power and authority that parents have being abused and misused because it can be. And I recognize all the pain and the harm that parents can cause. But, but the potential for mistakes is not a reason to not be a parent. You know, when parents don't use their authority, when they just try to be friends with their kids or they avoid discipline or they avoid saying no to their children, they're doing their kids a disservice. It's not really loving your kids. If we entrust our children to God, we will use our authority as parents to set limits, to correct, to train, to, to parent our children. You know, one of the ways we can leverage our influence as parents and to be a parent is by setting clear expectations. And my family joked about this last Christmas in our Christmas Eve uh, promotional video. Check it out. So, what's our plan for getting a photo? I'm thinking lots of snacks. I was thinking clear expectations. So, you guys, we'd like you to smile for the camera and not look like you're being murdered. And maybe when we're done, there will be snacks. So, everyone, smile and say clear expectations. Three, two, one. Clear expectations! Snacks! While we joked about it in that video, clear expectations are really important for leveraging your influence as a parent. I often say if I could give one piece of parenting advice, it would be to have consistent, clear expectations. Now that sounds simple, but it's one of the most difficult things to do as a parent. Why? Well, because our moods change, our circumstances change, our energy levels change, and yet when we are consistent and loving in our expectations with our children, well, they'll thrive. When there are clear, loving expectations with reinforcement for meeting expectations, your children will have increased health and well-being. When my family was preparing to make the Christmas Eve video, we told our kids about what we were going to do for the video, and well, they pushed back a little bit on the clear expectations part. They weren't sure it was accurate to our family, and I loved that feedback uh, because it gave me and Jana an opportunity to pull back the curtain with our teenagers, uh, show them our parenting, and let them see each time we had clear expectations. And when we did that, it, it was like a light bulb went on. Uh, suddenly, my kids started noticing all the ways that Jan and I were setting and clarifying expectations and consequences. You see, I invite God into my messy parenting when I continually entrust my children to the Lord and leverage my influence. Leverage your influence by being a parent and by setting clear expectations. As I said already, parenting is incredibly difficult. I, I call it relentless decision-making. And we can't do it on our own. This is why we have each other. Uh, this is especially why we entrust our children to God. As our kids grow and develop, their needs from their parents and from their community will change. Good parenting is always changing and growing along with our kids. At Sycamore Creek, we work to partner with parents in raising kids who are entrusted to Jesus. And we leverage our influence together to point our children to Christ. Now, that starts with the baptism of influence. We, we baptize young kids, welcoming them as children into the family of God. It continues through Kids Creek, where, where kids learn about prayer and Bible stories and how much God loves them. And we reinforce that for you at home by providing a Bible from our church. I work right now with the middle schoolers of our church in Teen Fuel uh, to help, help them to own their faith and put together the stories of the Bible and the teachings of the church into an overarching story. We celebrate our high school students when they graduate. And all these developmental milestones in the church are there to help mark the growth of our children. Our goal as a church is to support, support and equip parents to be the spiritual champions for their child. See, parenting is never easy. It's messy. It's difficult. It's relentless decision-making. But, but you will find greater wisdom, greater grace, and greater peace when you entrust your children to the Lord and leverage your influence. Now, parents, entrust your children to the Lord, doing what you can to leverage your influence, but also giving grace 
to yourselves and to your children. That day that Drew was born and I became a dad, it changed my life forever. I now know a whole new level of unconditional love for a child no matter what their age or stage in life. I now know a whole other level of care and concern that I didn't know I had. I know an experience of joy and heartache and stress and happiness and a host of other soul-deep emotions and experiences. I know a deeper appreciation for my own parents and for what I put them through. But most importantly, most importantly, I know a lot more of what God must experience as we are all God's children. May we as parents and as a community of faith in Jesus entrust our children to God. May we, may we leverage our influence to raise our children well. And may we as parents and as grandparents and as children, all, all of us together, experience God's love and God's grace in the messiness of parenting. Uh, here's a final fun question for all of us. What are your hopes and dreams for the next generation? With God, all things are possible. Amen.